forms have the occult meanings and influence his medical practice. He turned to astrology in the diagnosis of illness and with magical talismans that requested his patients. He diagnosed what modern psychologists might call mental illness as perhaps demonic influence and um, believe that this is what caused melancholic um, temperaments. His methods, which were slightly more astrologically based than the norm, drew the attention of the com company of barber surgeons who banned him from practicing medicine in 1594. After this action against him, Foreman became extremely paranoid and certainly reclusive. In his more private studies, he involved himself deeply with occult philosophy and practice. In his mind, God had given him special abilities to interpret the universe using astrology, and he felt that he had dominion over the spirits, the spirit world, through use of magic. He wrote in his diary that, quote, the very spirits were subject to me, what I spoke was done, unquote. In the 1580s, Foreman dived headfirst into practicing necromancy and scrying, which was the practice of using a psychic medium, a psychic medium to see the spirits in a crystal or a glass mirror. Um, and though he became increasingly anxious to see the spirits and wanted to command them, he was unable to communicate with them on his own outside of his dreams, in which he believed he saw. In 1587, Foreman took a scryer, John Goodridge, and began to practice necromancy and to call on angels and spirits. Five years later, he was still uh, having to ask Goodrich to see for him. However, Foreman believed he was blessed by God and possessed an innate occult talent. And if he devoted enough time to learning, he would be granted all the occult powers promised by the previous occult authorities, whom he greatly trusted. Then there's John Dee, Elizabethan England's most highly regarded natural philosopher, who is often compared to Simon Foreman as both engaged intensely in the study of occult philosophy. And Peter French, in his biography of John Dee, calls him the great Elizabeth Magus. John Dee's wide-ranging and deep erudition gained him the favour of Queen Elizabeth I, who appointed him a royal, a royal astrologer and counsellor, um, and, and he became Elizabeth's eyes and her noble intelligence and, her, and quote, most faithful Dee. And there is a note of awe and respect, which is not always apparent in her dealings with other learned men. Dee encouraged Elizabeth's interest in astrology and clairvoyance, and when she asked for the horoscope for Mary, who was queen at the time, he drew it up for her, which in the Tudor period was to almost tantamount to treason, and he was accused by two informers of attempting to kill Mary using black magic. Fortunately for Dee, he was acquitted and released. As court astrologer, he advised Elizabeth on the significance of a comet in 1577, and was given the task for reforming the Julian calendar in 1583. In return, Elizabeth promised to keep Dee safe from anyone who would want to cause him harm because of his reputation. Within the current English humanist movement, Dee's hermetic Platonism with its magic and mysticism seemed very subversive. Though occult philosophies challenged contemporary university teaching, he was still in high demand for his vast learning and was solicited by Leuven, Paris, Oxford and Cambridge. After being sought by universities and already the author of learned books, what more could his heart desire? The answer has tragic implications. He desired universal knowledge, and the scholar could not reconcile himself to human limitations and was always trying to transcend them. Leuven was his university of choice, and he traveled there in 1548, where he acquired the reputation of having extensive learning. Crucially, until 12 years before John Dee arrived, arrived, Leuven had been the home and refuge of the occult philosopher Cornelius Agrippa. His views were already keenly studied at the university, and Dee found himself greatly influenced by them. Peter French sees Dee's philosophy so saturated with Renaissance Hermeticism and occultism that it would be impossible to understand Dee without first comprehending his sources, with which, with which Dee had a remarkable familiarity. Like his ideological predecessors, he adheres to the antiquity theory of Hermes as a contemporary of Moses, and was one of the, one of the Hermetic movement's most, most extreme adherents. Like his continental antecedents, Dee placed ultimate authority in the importance of hierarchy. Chains of command assert their weight in every aspect of Dee's philosophy. At the top of the ladder is God, wisdom, and knowing, and the Magus must climb his way upwards towards understanding. He uses the group as models of the three-layered magic. At the lowest level was natural magic, which did not violate the laws of nature, but was a beginner's level. Here, magic was a natural philosophy, providing for powers and correspondences that can be manipulated and an ethos that sought to understand and capture and control the powers and processes of this nature. Only the most skilled and daring magicians operated through the highest level of magic, theological magic, because of its threat with coming in contact with non-angelic spirits. 
However, this must be the final step of the philosopher, as the occult correspondences of theological magic were seen as paths to divine and the spiritual ascent of the magus. Just as the magus could climb upwards, so divine knowledge could be passed down through the spheres. In his preface to Euclid, he explains his astrology as Neoplatonic, and later goes on to describe that the stars operate under Neoplatonic ideas of the spheres and the hermetic influences of so above and so below. These superlunar spheres were heavenly bodies and superior organisms through which God channeled his powers. <coughs> Directly from this first, the first sphere, God, the angels drink in the divine light, which was also the ultimate in divine knowledge. And then man can experience the divine light through the intermediary symbol of the sun. This actually helped to promote the idea of a heliocentric or Copernican universe, whereas previously hermetic philosophers believed in the geocentric universe, surrounded by spheres and other elements within the circular spheres of the moon, sun, stars, angels, and above them all and around them all was God. Dee, along with his European counterparts, embraced the Kabbalah. And Dee's library contained more Hebraic materials than any other library in England during the period, and many of his works were heavily annotated, showing his studious attention to the material. But his interest in Kabbalah was on practical magic, and his numerology seemed focused on the interest of angelic names, believing that saying them would give him command over these angels. In his table for the invocation of good angels, he was concerned expressly with discovering the names in the hierarchies of spirits. He used his talismans to attract angelic forces, sought out the 42-letter name of God in the Kabbalah. And though he seems concerned with demonology and the names of spirits, he connected Kabbalah's demonic operations with the celestial hierarchies of Pseudo-Dionysius, thereby cloaking unorthodox demonic magic in the approval of respectable Christian authority. He even assigned planets to each of the angels, furthering the fusion between angelic hierarchies and astrology. Probably the most bizarre aspect of John Dee's career is his long and intense dedication to the angelic conversations, a series of what he calls exercises and actions. Dee had begun to attempt contact with angels by 1581 and possibly as early as the 1560s. John Dee was already interested in angelic magic during his most ambitious scientific works of 1569 and 1570, and had begun scrying in crystal magic during the writing of his preface to Euclid. And this perhaps that he saw, this saw, suggests that he saw no fundamental division between natural philosophy and spiritualism. These conversations conform to the 16th century belief that God communicated through his intermediary spirits of the middle, of the middle areas to select individuals. Similar to Simon Foreman, Dee's preferred method of celestial contact is through scrying, though Dee did not scry himself, but hired a scryer. He had a series of scryers of varying degrees of ability, but it wasn't until he met at Edward Kelly in March of 1582 that his angelic experiments really wielded results. Edward Kelly, sometimes called Edward Talbot, and this change of name is often assumed to be the result of him hiding from a shady past, would gaze into a stone mirror and act as a medium of communication between Dee and the spirits. And though Dee probably knew of Kelly's rather dubious background in history, it seems to have no influence on his assessment of the seer's clairvoyant abilities. It is difficult to know whether or not he believed himself to possess supernatural powers, since he always relied on the aid of the scryer to communicate with the spirits, though he did on occasion record witnessing them firsthand. Dee's desire to make direct contact with the spirits would have been important if understood from a hermetic perspective. The closer Dee moves towards the angels and their knowledge, the higher up the Neoplatonic ladder he climbs as a result. While most contemporary scrying had a financial motivation, lo locating stolen goods or lost items, Dee used scrying as a means to mystical knowledge. In 1582, the angel Hagenel promises Dee that he will have power over, quote, all spirits inhabiting within the earth. And a year later, the angel Uriel speaks tantalizing about a book, quote, the book containeth three kinds of knowledge, the knowledge of God truly, the number and doings of his angels perfectly, and the beginning and the ending of nature substantially." End quote. It's easy to see how hints like these could have been torturous for the would-be Grand Magus. The ultimate goal of John Dee's science and magic was to understand God creative, God's creative genius. He saw his angel conversations as part of the magical hierarchy laid out by Agrippa. But his ever-increasing efforts with the conversations suggest that Dee had entered into a period of intellectual crisis, 
so profound that he began to doubt whether the information he could find in books could really help him achieve certain, these certain knowledges. With the celestial spheres and the transmission of knowledge, it seemed that beings could move up or down the spheres. As God's divine light filters downward through the angels and stars, so the devout magician can climb upwards towards wisdom. D moved variously down both pathways, sometimes dedicating his energies to devote studies and others desperately trying to receive top-down divine revelation. Peter French suggests, quote, these intense inner contemplations leading to direct mystical contact with divine men's, he may have learned Gnostic secrets, unquote. But his increasing attention towards his angelic experiments suggests that he was dissatisfied with what these meditations were revealing to him. He began to obsess over the lost primordial language that was supposedly the language Adam used to name all the animals and creative things. His long career in alchemy, in search for the philosopher's stone, would grant its possessor immortality. And this is even more revealing when he begins to call it the Adam Stone. It seems as though Dee desired to restore man to his pre-fallen state when he could be in direct contact with the divine. His desire was so intense that he not only abandoned his scientific experiments, but also neglected his humanist philological caution and overlooked the serious warnings against angel magic to be found in all of the works of his favorite cult authors. Although Dee's supposed intention fo uh, focused on dealing with purely angelic spirits, he seems to have been often in contact with devils, mischievous spirits, and dubious half-human beasts. Certainly, his magic bored him on the demonic. Dee's Book of Soiga emphasizes the magical aspects of writing backwards of literary fairy phrases. The Nostra Pater becomes the Tathrasen, the Lord's Prayer in Reverse, which was a common theme throughout continental necromantic ritual. Richard Deacon, comparing Dee's angels to his demons, claims that Dee was clear on the subject of angels as intelligent but passionless beings with a knowledge of the past and future, but with demons he was far more vague and evasive. Dee never seemed willing to deal with the obvious presence of the demonic within his magic, except to move, remove blame from himself as the pure philosopher who is not the object of their magnetic attraction. He believed that certain stars could be considered evil because of their heavy influence upon men, which could often propel men towards wickedness. However, the evil is already present within human nature and can only be amplified by the star's influences. Bernardus Saul, one of Dee's early squires, had a criminal record and elicited distrust from Dee, who recorded in his diary that there was an evil spirit that sought Saul's death because he is accursed. In the angelic conversations, demons and evil seem to be more frequent than divine knowledge. In November 1583, a spirit named King Benasper encouragingly says to Dee, quote, By me thou shalt cast out the power of wicked spirits, by me thou shalt know the doings and practices of evil men, and more than may be spoken or uttered to any man." Unquote. Even though this royal Benasper promises power over demons and angels, Satan himself seems bent on corrupting Dee's research. Uriel comes down to warn Dee and his squire that Satan has been using Edward Kelly, and Raphael claims that Satan has been working against them. On April 19th, 1590, Dee records a particularly trying day the week before, when the King of Darkness did what he could to, quote, hinder our proceedings, unquote. And their poor unsuspecting nurse Anne became possessed by a demon just a few sessions later. Dee seems to find comfort in blaming demonic influence on his scryers, allowing himself to maintain the position of pure and pious position. However, he had probably had ample reason to be anxious over Kelly, who began his career as an apothecary and quickly turned to crime and black magic. A well-known engraving shows two men standing within a circle of symbols, which on closer examination reveal themselves to be the names of angels invoked for the purpose of necromantic rituals. That is the illustration there for you guys. They have raised a corpse who appears to be speaking to the two magicians. Kelly has had his ears chopped off after being convicted of a crime, possibly forgery, and there is evidence to show that he at least dabbled in necromancy and black magic. Occult practitioners must practice with a pure mind or else run the risk of summoning the wrong spirits. <coughs> Another engraving, much later in the 19th century, has mimicked the earlier portrayal of necromantic rituals in the graveyard, but specifically names them the second magician standing with Delia to be John Dee, and both men look much less sure of themselves than in the early engraving. The descriptions of their demonic encounters and of their physical appearances seem to follow a theme. On July 4th, 1583, Dee writes in 
um, that the demons, quote, appear 14 of diverse evil favored shapes, some like monkeys, some like dogs, some very hairy, monstrous men, etc., and they seem to scratch each other in the face, end quote. And earlier that year, on March 23rd, a spirit appears um, in the stone, and Dee writes, quote, I charged him if he were an enemy of God to depart. He tore his clothes all and appeared hairy under and said, you have pierced through the force of my iniquity, end quote. As the demon disappeared, quote, he went away as if it had been a bunch of feathers pulled into pieces, end quote. The demons that come during the angelic summons appear to be half humanoid, half animal. While Dee was in London, Kelly had used the stone without his employer's guidance and saw an evil spirit in the disguise of an angel, a good spirit or angel who had been guiding them through the Adamic language. But when the spirit was forced to tell the truth, quote, his outward and beautiful apparel seemed to go off and his body appeared hairy and he confessed that he was an eluder, end quote. An illustration of Dee and Kelly in the act of scrying depicts a demon flying over them in the shape of a lizard or an alligator. Maybe you guys that one as well. Another interesting non-angelic experience occurs when Deli, uh, Kelly is assaulted by demons which look like, quote, laboring men having spades in their hands and hair hanging all about their ears, end quote, who are attacking Dee and Kelly. It is interesting to imagine that, as Dee says, Kelly has to point to where they are flying, and then Dee swings an axe into the invisible air in the direction that Kelly is motioning towards. Um, and they only leave when Dee finally brandishes a cross. Simon Foreman, who was also experimenting in scrying, openly practiced necromancy, and was not as discriminating with the spirits he tried to contact. And similarly to Dee, the demons which Foreman comes into contact with manifest as animals, and at one point, a dubious spirit named uh, Salathiel appears in the form of a dog. The conjuring of demons in the form of animals is easier to explain if we turn to a history of anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic legends and shape-shifting creatures. But the laboring men with spades are harder to explain, unless we imagine an even greater cosmic hierarchy in which everything on every level strives to move upwards towards the divine. In this sense, the animals and the laboring men are not so out of place as being perhaps lower on the celestial hierarchy than Dee, who sees himself as the great magician, welcome at the court of even Queen Elizabeth. These demonic encounters weigh heavily on Dee's mind, though he tried to explain them away by the negative influences of his less than admirable scryer. As he moved deeper into the occult studies of scrying and the angelic conversations, he began to be troubled by nightmares of screeching owls. Richard Deakins explains that the nocturnal noises that he was reporting at the time, quote, may have been magnified and distorted in his half-awake mind as the result of hidden yearnings for a form of spiritual intercourse with the unseen, end quote. For Dee himself had little direct connection with the spirits when compared to the claims of his scryer. Edward Kelly was not as enthusiastic about the angelic conversations as Dee was, and often claimed that they were a waste of time. Dee and Kelly had very different motivations, however, and where Dee was interested in knowledge, Kelly, Kelly was interested in the monetary reward and wanted to devote time to alchemy and the transmutation of matter into gold. Kelly repeatedly tried to sway Dee away from the angelic experiments by pointing out that most of the spirits they had contacted were actually evil and that they should not be dabbling in demonic magic. An interesting concern considering that Kelly himself was an infamous necromancer. But uh, nevertheless, Kelly's anxiety surrounding the demonic um, seemed to be centered not on the animal or the laborer, but the feminine demon and demonic sexuality, which permeated the occult practices of both John Dee and Simon Foreman. Madini was a spirit which often appeared during Dee's scrying sessions and would give information about important visiting diplomats in foreign affairs. She began to appear in May 1583 and was described as, quote, a pretty girl of seven or nine years of age who is childlike and a pretty maiden, end quote. Dee reaffirms her youth and innocence throughout the following months, and in June writes that Madini, quote, appeared before as a little and young girl, end quote. However, as the years go on and the angelic conversations continue, Madini's role as the innocent and benevolent spirit changes drastically. In 1587, Kelly sees uh, Madini appear in the stone, exposing herself, quote, in a very filthy order, unquote. While the other spirits continue to manifest, quote, in that most disorderly and uh, filthy order, 
in quote. On 18th of April, 1587, all the other spirits move away, and only Medini remains, and then she, quote, openeth and openeth all of her apparel, and showeth herself naked, and showeth her shame also, end quote. Something remarkable has happened with the angelic conversations with the sudden exposure of Medini's sexuality. It is possible that she has aged along with the years, starting at age 9 in 1587, and then um, she becomes 13 later on. And her transition from innocence to adolescence is marked by the change in the methods of the angelic experiments. Madini orders them to share their wives, what Dee would refer to as marital cross-matching. The spirits demand that in order for Dee to continue in his occult pursuits of the divine knowledge, he would essentially have to engage in a kind of sex magic. These new commands on the part of the spirits and Dee's acceptance of them have often been regarded by serious scholars as an embarrassment, but it demonstrates just how far Dee was willing to go in his desperate pursuit of knowledge. Both Dee and Kelly seem reluctant to submit to the new cross-marital doctrines, and Dee questions the spirits as to their exact meaning, hoping that perhaps they need a more metaphorical sharing. The command is issued so suddenly and is so out of the norm from the previous expeditions into the Adamic language and numerology that it seems it can, be only be, it can only be explained by Kelly's extreme hatred of the angelic experiments, and Dee notes that Kelly had repeatedly said they thought they should not deal with the spirits any longer. However, when Kelly's pleas based on the supposed wickedness of the spirits were ignored, Kelly must have pushed the issue even further. Dee's diaries attest to his fidelity, as well as the abstinence he practiced as a mean to attain spiritual purity that was necessary for those in search of higher mysteries. Kelly, knowing Dee, could have invented the commands, never expecting him to go through with it. However, it is also noted by Richard Deacon that Kelly was known to give gifts to Dee's wife and often compared his own life unfavorably to her. Very disappointed at the turn in Dee's angelic um, events, E.M. Butler wrote that, quote, between them, he and his squire, um, had also initiated a new kind of necromancy, imbued with a particular blend of phoniness, holiness, and feeble-mindedness, end quote. Dee, though it may seem strange that he accepted the new doctrine which sexualized their magic, was well aware of the complications surrounding the female demons and had hints of sexual magic in his symbol of the monas which Peter French claims is a sexual symbol of the sun and the moon interlocking, quote, to suggest their conjunction and generative faculty, unquote. And though he seemed willing to include sexual symbolism in his hermetic philosophies, when it came to feminine spirits, he was much more anxious. In 1583, when he comes in contact with Galva, a female spirit, he writes that, quote, Tritamius saith that never a good angel was read to have appeared in female form. Galva reassures him that angels are, quote, neither man nor woman, therefore may those that are the eternal ministers of God in his proportion of sanctification take unto them the bodies of them both, end quote. While John Dee seemed an uneasier practitioner of sexual magic, Simon Foreman recorded his uses of it openly in his diaries. <coughs> he used talismans engraved with phallic symbols for virility throughout his career, but especially at the end of 1596 when he was looking for a wife. Indeed, Feingold writes that it is, quote, impossible to evaluate Simon Foreman's career without considering his incessant preying on women, end quote. He would often sleep with several women in one day, probably medical patients, and meticulously recorded the outcomes for astro astrological purposes. He had a fixation on the power relations between men and women, and this seems to manifest itself in his nightmares about witches. Foreman detested witchcraft but certainly believed in its power and strongly criticized books that expressed doubt in its, in its existence. He believed that the elite magician was superior to the witch because the magician operated with the consent of the divine and with the intention to make use of magic to glorify God. That he had nightmares about witchcraft illustrates his anxiety of both feminine occult power, but also perhaps the proximity of his own, of his own magic, the illicit magic of witchcraft. In his dreams, three witches approach him to, quote, feed, end quote, off the learned magician's power, which portrays witches not as individuals, like the magician who works mostly in solitude, but portrays them en masse, therefore becoming a larger threat. The problems that the existence of witchcraft proposes to the elite magician are numerous, 
not least the question of legitimacy. Elijah Colts has bypassed this concern by placing witchcraft solely into the realm of the demonic. And it's worth considering that before the demonologists put a diabolic spin on familiars, they were, probably, they were popularly conceived to be the angelic guardians of cunning folk and other healers. But the witchfinder general, Matthew Hawkins, would later proclaim that all animal familiars were either wicked, wicked or fallen angels. In this sense, the animal demonic and the feminine demonic are bound up together and are perhaps inseparable when looking at Dee's conversations with angels. While given the anxiety about animals and humans in this context, it is tempting to look at these transformations from a kind of delusion, becoming animal, becoming woman perspective. But I think there's much more going on here. The animal and the woman, the animal and the woman both representing lower forms than the higher man, specifically the educated magician man. Perhaps these manifestations of woman and animals are the demonic threat to John Dee's pious reaching towards the heavens and towards the transcendence of his human self into the higher spheres of the divine. How then can we interpret his agreement with Kelly to share his wife? When I was addressing this issue with a friend, feeling quite smug about myself and saying, oh, well, of course you can't mix, mix Dee's Gnosticism with life-swapping sex magic, he answered, why not? And this really led me to think about Dee's abandonment of worldly goods and pleasures as a mode in line with his abandonment of his prized possession, his wife, only after he relinquishes this final object from his guarded collection can he be truly free from the earthly ties that often accompany relationships. Perhaps instead of looking at it as gaining a multitude of sexual partners and engaging in sex magic, it was this abandonment of the earthly that put this practice in line with the philosophers he so much admired. Thank you. <laughs>